So, oh, recording in progress. Good stuff. So, yes, we are here to talk about implementing a data mesh architecture. And the thing that I like to do the most here is discuss the, the theory of a data mesh architecture versus the practice. I'm a, a practical person. I will learn by doing, and, and that's how I think about things. And as you probably gathered, I'm very much aligned to the, the Microsoft stack of technology. Um, it doesn't necessarily matter, I guess, in some cases, but today we're, we're very much going to focus on the Azure stack and think about implementing a data mesh with Azure technologies. So as um, I've kind of been introduced, uh, I'll put up sort of a, a bio slide, if you like, and the, the usual things here. Yes, I'm a data platform MVP. I run the data relay conference uh, i've very deliberately worn my data relay t-shirt here which will be um, taking place next month the the first week of october touring the country uh, free to attend so you know sort of plug that event and get people registered for that i am a technical reviewer and uh, currently authoring a book for o'reilly as well on synapse and sort of here's all the the usual things but what it, I came to realize is that um, just like in the, the animal kingdom, dogs introduce themselves by sniffing each other's backsides, right? You know, this is just what dogs do. It's, it works for them. Um, what I think has come to pass, certainly in the, the IT industry, and you probably gather this is kind of my sense of humor a little bit, but we don't introduce ourselves now with this sort of bio slide that I've got here. That's just a bit too formal and boring. We introduce ourselves by asking each other, how many monitors do you use? So I felt this is a better way to introduce myself. This is the desk I'm, I'm stood at now talking to you. So this is my home office. I use three monitors. The, the one there in the center, it's uh, a Dell 49 inch monitor. Yeah, this, is, this is how we introduce ourselves. So just my sense of humor, but hey, this probably tells you more about me than uh, a bio slide does. And, this picture is certainly a, a lot tidier than my desk is right now. So I won't turn the camera around. Okay, so that's what we're here for. And, and that's a bit about me. Now, data mesh is a big topic. It's a big topic to, I think, even talk about within an hour. So we need to set some context here. We need to take a, a little bit of a, a run up to it, if you like. So the way I'm going to set the context is is this and maybe audience participation if you like via the chat uh, entirely up to you but i'm going to start with this question what is the answer to life the universe and everything and i, I think in most sort of geeky audiences we we know where i'm heading here right we we think okay yeah i know this one the answer is 42 right i'm here to i want to change history today so i want to say no the answer is not 42. Shock horror, right? What I want to say to you is, and, and certainly as a, a consultant and in my day job, I think a much better answer to this question. more serious and say okay what is the goal of our data solutions very sort of general very sort of simplistic here and what we normally see and what we normally expect is that we have some data sources some data collection happening on the, the left hand side there and we want to gain insight from that data sort of normal thing you know we want to be data driven we want to have that competitive edge in whatever industry vertical we're working to support our customers because as we know data can become information that can become knowledge that can become power so how do we achieve that and the very again overly simplistic gray box i'm going to draw here in the middle is well you know well how do we do that you know is it going to be a magic box from the hogwarts school of witchcraft and wizardry no, of course not. 
So the, the thing that I think we can just represent here in the middle, or at least I'm going to represent, is a data warehouse. You know, let, let's be overly simplistic again. It's that data warehouse that is going to do all of that work that is going to allow us to gain insight from that. You know, we might want to analyze and, and clean and model, predict, transform, all of those usual things that allow us to get from source to insight with that data. Now, if that's sort of very much the, the goal, let's just kind of flip things a moment and think about technology. So there's a sort of very rough evolution of data platforms. And my timeline starts with SQL Server 2000. I'm old. You can probably see the, the gray of my hair here. So I started life as a BI developer, creating VB scripts in SQL 2020, 00, zero SQL 2000, DTS packages, you know, so this was very much kind of where I started my, my developer life. And of course, we, we roll forward through all the additions of SQL Server that Microsoft have given us. But then that evolution, of course, kind of took a bit of a branch. And in sort of February 2010, Microsoft launched Azure, and they started giving us these cloud offerings, these cloud services or resources that allow us to do all of these things as well. Now, our goal of delivering a data platform and getting insight from it remained the same. We just had some different technology. I think that in a lot of cases here, there are no real new concepts. I think there are not really any new problems. I think the problems and concepts stay the same. We just have this evolution of technology to support us in doing that. Some of it good, some bad, you know, some makes it easy, some not, you, know, you get the idea. So if we think about that technology and we kind of just overlay that with our goal or my overly simplistic goal there of that data collection and that warehouse and that insight, then what I've kind of come to appreciate is that really what happened when the cloud came along is that it just gave us that ability to decouple things a lot more the technology that we had on premises was very much coupled together in terms of compute and storage it only scaled up in most cases so then when we transition to the cloud we can say fine we're still trying to achieve the same thing here but we can now very easily decouple that compute storage and, and I've, i put orchestration in here as well that goal remains the same now, if we take that and we go forward, you know, maybe we could even call this a reference architecture, if you like, a very simplistic, very crude one, sure, but, you know, we could say that. And, you know, we think, well, what else is out there then? What else exists if this is the path we've gone down and, and what we're trying to achieve here? And if we ask Microsoft, we say to Microsoft, you know, what do you have? And, and this is Microsoft's view of its components in what we can now, or what Microsoft calls a big data architecture. I think big data is now sort of very relative and, and fairly subjective, but Microsoft have a, a similar set of boxes, you know, data sources on the left and, and analytics and reporting over on the right. And then we, you know, we go through storage, processing, compute and things. We have orchestration there as well. Fine, you know, so the, the problem, the goal hasn't really changed here. If we put that in context, and, and as you gathered, I work for Avenard, hence all of the, the sort of the orange branding here. At Avenard, we would go sort of a lot deeper with those boxes, would, would include a lot more in there. This was a picture that I drew for Avenard of, of what a phone could look like, including all of the things. And yeah, we could, if we want, lay in some technology along the way we can choose from this picture what resources we need for whatever our use case is and you know we we go forward we still are achieving the same thing though so if we sort of flip that again and think okay well that is our goal that's what we want our data platform to do and i say okay what are the requirements then yeah, you know, this is always the challenge with customers, right? Don't tell me what you want. You know, tell me what you're actually trying to achieve here, what you're trying to do, and let me figure it out for you. So maybe 
again, to be overly simplistic, I'm going to say that the requirements are going to be extract, transform, and load. Familiar, right? And if we say, okay, well, we know what our goal is, we know what we need to do here, what are we actually going to build? Now, if we're in Azure, I might do something a bit like this with a sort of data extract or, or data ingestion pattern. I might use data factory with some integration runtimes. Maybe I've got an express route in here that connects to my source systems, possibly. Maybe there's some sensitive data that's coming in. We need to be GDPR compliant. We can handle that sensitive data as part of our ingestion processes for that sort of batch load of data, possibly. We might have some real time or near real time. Again, subjective based on your industry, but we've got some hot data coming in as well. We might handle it via an IoT hub or an event hub. We might use Azure Stream Analytics to bring it into our solution. We could do. And we could say that this is going to be our data extract or, or ingestion pattern that we use for our data platform solution. So we could go and build that. If we turn our attention to that data transformation work, you know, where we want to figure out what our business model is going to be. We want to become source system agnostic and we want to start sort of preparing that data and, and cleaning it and getting it ready. We might carve up our data lake a little bit like this, you know, using those different layers. You know, we're, we're very sort of governed here. We will make sure it stays nice and clean and, and true to what we intended it to be. We might format that data using the open source standard now delta lake a very good way to get those acid resilient transactions over that data in a data lake storage account and as you probably gathered from the icons at the bottom there we might use data factory to orchestrate some of this and we might use azure databricks to do some of that transformation work as well you know possibly it's not about sort of wrong answers here it's just yeah this is what we could do and then if we take this forward and we turn our attention to that sort of load portion, you know, again, it's what are we really loading here? Is it really ETL or ELT or something else? It doesn't matter. But we then end up with possibly a set of resources to serve that data, to give our customers a semantic model so they can get that insight. They can start working with it and they can start using it. You know, and this could be a, fairly sort of standard architecture that we might have been delivering in Azure for the past sort of five, four or five years, maybe. We could do that. And because we are good developers, we, you know, implement a, a series of CI, CD processes, you know, and, and good practice there with source control and, and DevOps, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we give it that wrapper as we deploy through test, pre-production, production. We break out a set of monitoring resources that Microsoft give us if we enable diagnostic settings from some of these things to get that telemetry to support our operational or managed services teams. We could do that. We could extend our orchestration and be cost-effective with scaling up and down our services scaling in and out or, or pausing and resuming our clusters you know we, we could do this we might want to consider vnet connectivity in here that extra layer of security using those private network connections so we might want to sort of add that into the mix as well we of course need to consider security pretty much from day one we need to consider security but you know we, we have it included in here as well some azure key vaults some service principles some custom roles in our azure tenant maybe sure if you're me you might want to include a metadata driven orchestration framework to handle all of that processing through those pipelines so you know this pitch is now getting fairly deliberately busy and complicated as to the sort of architecture that we could go out and build to achieve that goal of getting from source data to insight delivered using a series of Microsoft Azure PaaS resources. So this is what we could do. So let's kind of bear that in mind as a, 
an architecture maybe as a, a blueprint that we might want to take forward, we might want to implement. So with that context then, let's now think about data mesh and let's introduce data mesh. Now, the, the, there's lots of ways we could talk about data mesh, certainly, but the way I'm going to introduce it to you initially is very much just as a three-sided thing. Data mesh is about people, process, and technology. We need all three of those for a data mesh architecture to work, to be implemented, to be effective. If you're not a fan of triangles, it's okay. I prefer Venn diagrams. So, you know, we could draw this as circles, same thing, same idea. Where those circles overlap, we see our data mesh architecture arise from the ashes. Now, when it comes to the people side of it, we could go off in a whole bunch of different directions here, dealing with culture and personas and structure, you know, teams, skill sets, operating models, all the rest of it. When it comes to process, you know, we, we could, again, go off in a, a whole bunch of different directions, ways of working, you know, agility, governance, et cetera, et cetera. What I want to say to you today is that, you know, we have to be sort of, we have to restrict that scope a little bit. We can't go off in all these different directions, despite having that awareness that in order to deliver a data mesh architecture, we will have to deal with those non-technical things as well. But the scope for our talk today about implementing it is going to be very much technology focused because solutionizing and, and geeking out with technology, that's kind of the, the more easy, the fun part, or it certainly is for me anyway. I'm a technologist. I like to think about how we solutionize this. I like to break out a whiteboard and you know start drawing pictures. I tell my family my job is just drawing pictures and coloring in, and I think they believe me. So... As a technologist, we will kind of scope our talk today to look at the technology of a data mesh. Now, of course, the next thing we need to do when it comes to introducing it is consider this lady, Shumak Dakani, if I'm pronouncing that right. And what we find, or, or what Shumak certainly blogged about through martinfowler.com in the beginning of data mesh was this and these four principles, domain-orientated, decentralized data ownership and architecture. Yeah, that's a big one on its, on its own. Data is a product, self-service data infrastructure and federated computational governance. And as I'm sure you're probably aware, since writing that blog post on martinfowler.com, Jumac has now authored a book on data mesh as well, a book that I keep with me at all times. So this is how we're going to introduce data mesh now and how we're going to think about it. And it's those four principles that I want us to take forward as technologists and think about. So we're just going to post it them and we're now going to think about, OK, with those four principles, what does that actually mean to us if we're going to go from theory to practice in delivering a data mesh or implementing a data mesh? So I'm going to start with the first two. Data is a product and that decentralized data ownership. So I'm going to come back to this one, my original goal, if you like, my overly simplistic reference architecture. And what I'm going to say is that let's consider this as a data product, everything that we had in there, everything that we want to achieve, getting that insight from some data. We want to wrap that up as a data product, and this is how we might want to think about it. Now, we also want to scale here. So we're not just necessarily thinking about one data product, we want to think about many. And that blueprint that I showed you earlier, that sort of initial architecture that we could implement, let's say that everything that's in there, that could go into our data product, that could be one data product that we want to define, that we want to stamp out and say, yes, you know, connect the dots with your source systems, figure out what your data model and the insight is you want to achieve, the questions that you want to answer, and that could become our data product. But this is kind of the, the wider point here, that the first thing I find that we have to do if we are considering a data mesh architecture is really define 
what that data product is going to be. Now, I said I like Venn diagrams, and this was kind of my stab at it. And there's a blog post that supports this thinking as well, that we need that data product to be domain driven. We need it to be technically capable and we need to make sure that that data is actually required. It's meaningful. We're actually going to get business value from it. Now, the amusing thing for me was that when I thought about defining a data product um, before actually reading Jamak's book, but Jamak also defines a data product with a Venn diagram. Hers has feasibility, value, and usability in it. So yeah, we're on the same sort of lines here. So we have to sort of front load that problem. We have to front load thinking about it. And the reason I find for doing this is that in lots of brownfield implementations, there will be a lot of people that will say, hey, you know, I've already got an architecture like that picture in the bottom right. I've already got a data product. But this is where I think we need to be careful. And we need to say, well, do you really have a data product? Does it really meet all of this criteria? So to play devil's advocate, I've also kind of blogged about what a data product is not. because so I think we have to be careful there. That technical capability that we might want to go after in our data product is key. So things to think about and sort of introducing it. But if we say, you know, this is going to be our starting point for that data product. Now, what I'm going to do as well is kind of ask some fairly pertinent questions along the way. And the first one we could say here is that should our data product handle both that transactional data or the, you know, that operational data as well as that analytical data, OLTP and OLAP? Yeah, maybe, but things to think about. My sort of blueprint there, of course, is very much about analytics and achieving insight because that's what we've been doing. But maybe there's room in there for that operational transactional data as well. So let's think about that. Let's take it forward and let's say, OK, well, we understand what we need to define as our data product and we have some idea about what needs to possibly go in there. OK, if we then come to build that in Azure, again, to be slightly simplistic here, but let's just deploy some Azure resource groups. These seem like good logical containers for everything that's going to go into that to give us our data product. But if we do that, then the second sort of challenge and the, and the second question I want to put forward is that, you know, when does that data platform become a mesh? Now, at the moment, if we had these four resource groups, for me, that feels like a very sort of siloed setup. That's not really a data mesh because there's no interaction there. These are just isolated analytics platforms with sort of no connectivity. So the analogy I like to use, and, and I'm sure most do, is a car. Those data products become the wheels of that car, right? And as I'm sure we can appreciate, for a car to be effective, it probably needs four wheels, not one. They need connecting together. So we have these four data products here in this scenario. Now, if we do that, and you know, we've got the, the other parts of the car here, if we extend that metaphor and say, yes, you know, we have a chassis, steering wheel, et cetera, et cetera, then what makes a minimum viable data mesh? Or you know, what does that minimum viable data mesh contain? Is it one data product? Is it two? Is it three? I would argue that it's certainly not one. We might do all of that work to front load what our data product is and how we build it, but it's not really going to be a data mesh unless we have that scalability and that interaction. So let's consider then those interfaces. I've said that at the moment these are very siloed resource groups or potentially. So what interfaces might we actually create then? We've got this Azure cloud set of, of technologies. And what I like to define when we're considering an implementation here is three things. Firstly, our primary interfaces. Primary interfaces for the purpose of data integration and exchange. You know, the, the main goal here of getting insight and 
getting something from that data that we've ingested. So if we consider that and, and that data insight that we want to gain and, and this sort of primary set of interfaces, what do we actually deploy? Now everyone thinks, okay, yeah, I just need an API. Everything needs an API. Sadly, my wife doesn't have an API, but hey, you know, we have to talk to each other. So we need to figure out what are we going to surface as our primary interfaces there? Is it going to be batch? Is it going to be real-time orientated, you know, sort of messaging? So we could very simplistically say input process and output here. What interface is going to support it? Now, what I would love to be the case is that that input is done by magic, silver bullets and magic, right? That's how we like data ingestion to happen. And what I would like as the output is natural language. I would like to be able to query things in natural language. Now, I know that there's certain products and things where we can kind of do that. Not perfectly, of course, but if this is going to be our goal, then we're not quite there yet. I don't think the technology currently allows magic and natural language to be our inputs and our outputs. So I try and dissect it in this way. Is that data going to be pushed or pulled, you know, hot or cold? And I try and figure out from this sort of simplistic matrix of Azure resources, what do I actually need to deploy here to make this happen? But it's just one way we could think about it. Now, given my experience of the technology and where I've come in my career, the output that sort of seems to ring true the most is SQL, SQL, Structured Query Language. It seems to be a popular way to actually explore and interact with that data to get that output. We don't have natural language, of course, yet, but we can start with perhaps SQL. And we can say that SQL is maybe then going to be the primary output for our data product. Now, whatever we want to go and define, whatever our requirements are, as long as we have consistency here, we're OK. And for a lot of those icons that I've got on screen, as you probably know, SQL is supported for a lot of them when we come to querying that data and interacting with it. So let's start and say, yes, I'm going to have a data mesh data product it's going to have these capabilities. It's going to have SQL as its output or its primary interface to allow interaction with it. So we could do that. And we take that forward. And that becomes our primary interface within our mesh. Now, the next thing I like to define is what I'm going to call the secondary interfaces. And those secondary interfaces, I want the purpose of those to be about reporting and operations, logging, monitoring, telemetry. We need to obviously support our managed services teams. And if SQL is going to be the language we use for our primary interfaces in this mesh, it feels like almost certainly KQL, Custo. Custo queries are going to be the secondary thing that we want to surface as our interface into this for reporting and monitoring. Now, KQL, we can write that against Azure Log Analytics. We can write it against Azure Data Explorer. We can use Azure Data Studio to pass those KQL queries to our Data Explorer instance. This works quite well. It's quite nice. But there's then a sort of another problem or certainly another question that springs to mind for me. Should all data mesh capabilities be decentralized? We want that scalability. And what I've kind of very deliberately drawn here in the picture is that for those four hypothetical data products on my screen, should all of that log telemetry converge in a platform or a resource like Data Explorer? for an operational team to go in there. I think we have to be pragmatic, pragmatic in lots of cases. So what I might do is if I were implementing this for a individual data product, I might have a log analytics instance to handle that telemetry and do things within that data product. I then might say that I've got another level to that telemetry that goes into Data Explorer. Data Explorer then brings together telemetry across the mesh, possibly. 
or maybe within a data domain. And we've not talked about data domains yet, but we could do that. So this is where the technology has to gel with the principles, the concepts, and I say where I think we have to be pragmatic. I'm going to go forward. I'm going to say, yes, this is what we're going to do. Log analytics in the product. We're going to use KQL unanimously across all of those things. Maybe we have a centralized data explorer instance for all of that telemetry. Fine. So we've got our primary and our secondary interfaces defined and how we might want to implement them in Azure. Thirdly, our tertiary interfaces. Now, what I've done is, and what I've defined as the tertiary interfaces here is things focused on resource connectivity, the networking, the infrastructure, the private endpoints. So what do we have? Well, in my data products, that, that sort of blueprint architecture I drew, if you start looking at this, and I'm by no means a, an infrastructure person, I will build CAT6 cables in my garage if I need to for my home network, but that's kind of the extent of it, really. I understand VNets and things. So when I look at this picture, I've got some VNets along the bottom. I've got some service endpoints, some private endpoints. But really, if we want things to connect here, we need a whole bunch of stuff. We need all things in all joins and, and sort of my magic wand here of how everything talks to each other. But to kind of bring that down to earth a little bit and to offer a, a use case that I'm certainly more familiar with, if we said simply <clears throat> we want in our solution, in our data product, we want a data factory, we want a data lake, and we want data bricks, and we want to use the to private link connectivity, maybe we've got an express route in play here as well. There's a whole bunch of infrastructure that we have to put in place to facilitate that. Our Databricks clusters have to be VNet joined. We have to have private endpoints for our storage. And depending on how we interact with that storage via the blob suffix or the, the file system suffix for that data lake, we might have to have two private endpoints on that subnet within this VNet. We might have to have DNS zones to support that lookup of those private IP addresses. So there's all this infrastructure and stuff that needs to happen here as well within this data product if we're going to implement this sort of good practice of private connectivity and that connection to that express route as well. Which is why I felt that these tertiary interfaces needed representing within the mesh. It has to be there. So, you know, for all of those products across that mesh to talk, they have to have some consistency, some standards here when it comes to how this is going to happen. Now, in my picture that I've kind of been using here as the, the center point, I've got some VNets in the middle. I've got an express route icon and I've got kind of a hub and spoke approach to doing it. But where do we go? You know, does that is that the only option that we use? You know, and the answer is simply no. We could do full VNet peering across all data products. Now I've got four in here, but if we had hundreds of data products or, or more, then having to enable VNet peering retrospectively for every new data product that we onboard in our platform, that's going to be a kind of an operational and a management overhead. So maybe option one isn't the way to go. We could, but maybe not. Maybe we do consider more of a hub and spoke approach to it. This is what I've seen in a few enterprise customers now. You know, it, it tends to work, but we end up paying Microsoft more for that hub VNet. Microsoft will charge us for data transfers between those VNets. So it means we don't have the management overhead. We can just connect every new data product to the hub at deployment time, which is good, you know, easier but we, it kind of costs us more. Depends where we want the battle, right? We could, and this is what Microsoft would probably suggest to you, we could have targeted service and private endpoints <clears throat> that allow those data products to connect. If you know product A needs to talk to product B, we just put a service endpoint or a private endpoint in place. But for me, that really doesn't work, especially if we're spanning Azure regions. 
service endpoints won't work across regions at the moment. So there's sort of technical limitations there, but also, as you can kind of clearly see, we've got a disconnect between some of those data products and we have to do more deployments if necessary, if we were gonna go with option three. So, you know, a bit of a challenge. There's other options to consider around, you know, uh, public endpoints with firewalls and things and, and now sort of managed private links that is Microsoft is kind of next generation offering to address some of this stuff, but it's a challenge. And in our data mesh, we need to think about this if we implement it in Azure, if we're going to consider best practice. To double down on that problem and to offer some experience kind of from the field as well, for multinational customers, they might already have a hub and spoke model across various Azure regions for things to connect. Fine. We might have some data products or data domains that kind of sit in here and, and are isolated and things. And we, of course, want them to interact in this data mesh that we create, this idealistic data mesh that kind of spans all of these things. Now, I've had challenges where we want data product A to contact data product B. And very deliberately here, I've got one in say the East US, I've got one in the South Australia, Azure region. And suddenly our data mesh falls down because we don't have any direct VNet peering between those respective hub and spokes. So, you know, it becomes a challenge and then it obviously takes a lot of effort to get that extra peering in place. Otherwise, we go round the houses, say, via the, the European hubs and things, and we end up paying Microsoft even more money because we have to ping that connectivity all around the place to get that data mesh, to get those two data products interacting. So it becomes a challenge. That idealistic view of a mesh, it's sort of when we start implementing it, it does offer these technical challenges in addition to the, the people in the process. So food for thought. But, you know, let's go with it. Let's be mindful of what we could implement and mindful of what I'm introducing to you as how I would do it with this primary, secondary and tertiary set of interfaces, speaking technically to what those data products might need in order to become part of a mesh. So let's turn our attention now to the second principle here, domain oriented decentralized data ownership. Now, in Azure, that could be kind of a, an easy one to go after. We could take those four data products in my picture, and I've got the Azure icon, the Azure subscription icon here quite deliberately. What we might say is that I'm going to encapsulate those as a data domain. We have to figure out through people and process what our data domains look like firstly, but what we can say is from a technical perspective, maybe let's implement a data domain as an Azure subscription. That seems like a good natural way to sort of separate and charge for it. You know, we can have lots of subscriptions within our tenant for sales, operations, whatever. So maybe an easy one. Defining what our data domains are in terms of people and process, much harder. From a technical perspective, we could do this with Azure subscriptions, or at least I would. So, that's kind of an easy one. And kind of just to sort of recap and summarize there, we've got what we need in terms of our data products. We've got all of those Azure resources that we might want to implement to deliver that with those interfaces, with those wider data domains as well. Fine. So what else then? We've covered off those first two principles of our data mesh. Let's think about the other two. This federated computational governance and this self-service infrastructure as a platform. Now to kind of continue the picture here and, and start with what I had, let's sort of update it a little bit. Let's now consider the planes of our data mesh because I think we can evolve the drawing to support it. I'm going to say we've got this PaaS plane for our data products. I'm going to say we've got this IaaS plane for that infrastructure that we need there, that the VNets or, or VMs or whatever. We build those data products using the interfaces that we need for the requirements that we want, you know, batch or real time or whatever, you know, and that's what goes in there. So if we kind of park that to one side and say, okay, you know, this is a good starting point, 
and we then turn our attention to the, the theory once more, the theory versus the practice. So this is the picture that Jumac gives us. So what I've done very deliberate here is I've taken that picture and thought about, well, you know, what else could we have? So I've taken that picture and I've created my version of it. So this is my version of delivering a data mesh in Azure with Azure icons now to be specific with what we're doing rather than obviously just the, the, the more sort of cartoony versions on the left. So if that's what we're going to do, and we're going to think about that in the context of that third principle, self-service data infrastructure. Now, that is a challenge. That is a challenge that we're going to try and address with our DevOps practices, possibly. In brownfield engagements, really challenging. In greenfield engagements, there's a lot to front load here. We need to consider what our IDs are, our IDEs are, what our templates are going to be, what tooling we're going to use. If we want self-service infrastructure, and we're really going to go after that, we've got to do a lot of work to front load what those Azure templates are going to be. The customers that I've worked with, I say, I want to deploy Databricks. Fine. Databricks has got a whole bunch of different options and configurations depending on what that enterprise wants, what they consider compliant for a Databricks workspace. So straight away, we have to create our own internal template. And then we have to wrap that up with some other stuff, some PowerShell, some deployment pipelines, some, some YAML, and whatever else has to go in there, whatever our tooling chooses to be to get that running. So we have to kind of bake all of that stuff in as well. We have to have a very disciplined workflow of that template being selected by whoever wants it, using it, customizing it for what they need and deploying it. But that self-service infrastructure, it really needs a lot of guardrails if we're gonna truly allow that to happen. Because infrastructure of course could be deployed in lots of ways, which means it's not compliant, it's not secure. It's not connected to the right VNet. And implicitly, all of those interfaces that I've already talked about for our data products, they have to be included as well. We have to bake that in to our infrastructure templates. So definitely a hard one. This is what I might do. I might choose some BICEP. I might source control it in GitHub. I might use some YAML to deploy it. And we might have some custom build agents that sort of scale and, and wrap some of that up. But we're still not quite there when it comes to self-service. It's probably still more of an engineering function than a business user function to do that. So there's still some other things we could do with the front ends to make it more configuration driven, possibly. But food for thought. Next, then, what else do we need to address? We need to address that federated computational governance. Again, a hard one to go after. Now, if we think about our users that want to gain insight from all of this stuff that we've created, do we simply say, you know, sure, go ahead, do some cross data product joining, create your own data model, probably do it in Excel, because most business users would, or Power BI, you know, whatever your tool of choice is, go and do that and create that. Now, the problem we've got is that as soon as somebody opens Excel or opens Power BI and starts connecting to these things and brings stuff together, they will, they will almost certainly save it. They will persist that new model somewhere else. And we then sort of lose that governance that we want. We want a single version of the truth to remain. So we have to be careful here. So the way we need to implement it is with these multi-plane components. We need to figure out what the technical answer is going to be here to that virtualization layer. A virtualization layer that does not persist that data from the data products anywhere else. We might want to consider some serverless options in Synapse. We might want to consider a semantic layer in analysis services. You know, Power BI is in there. We've got the Power Platform now with Power BI Premium as well and the offerings that we get. So it becomes a technical challenge. We almost certainly want to include some cataloging 
we want to possibly use Databricks to serve all of it with the Unity catalog offerings now and Delta sharing. I think the technical answer here is still a little unclear, particularly if we want to maintain that federated governance. Federated in the sense that it's distributed and scalable, but then the sort of challenge that I had earlier about what should be centralized in the mesh and ultimately what technology should be used to deliver insight across that mesh. Insight, you know, the thing that we're sort of trying to achieve initially, particularly if we take that data mesh beyond the cloud, if we have a, an on-premises data domain or component to it as well, or maybe multiple data domains here have on-premises data sources that have to fit into it. Again, the technical answer I don't think is still quite clear. We have an idealistic view of how we're going to do it, but we've got some challenges along the way to figure out. So let's now sort of build on this picture and let's turn our attention to what we have in the theory as the planes of the data mesh. Jumak describes these as our data infrastructure plane, our data product developer experience plane, and that mesh supervision plane. So the first two we can kind of go after fairly easily. We can say, yes, I've got an IaaS plane here. I've got a PaaS plane, sort of aligned to standards of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. But that mesh supervision plane is kind of still this sort of magic ground that I don't think we've uncovered. So I'm going to describe it for now as a software as a service plane. You know, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS seems to make sense to me. And that software as a service plane is where we're going to gain that user interaction, where we're going to abstract all of the things to mean that we can have a citizen data scientist, a citizen data engineer, or, you know, a business user, a business analyst, somebody that doesn't have to be technical to come in here and work with this data. And to sort of build on my earlier metaphor of the car, I think about a car and I think, hey, an engineer has designed this car. They've designed the engine, you know, all of the, the internals, the electronics, etc. I don't need to be an engineer to drive the car. I think the same is true of our data mesh. We need to be engineers to build all of the complicated stuff but we then want our business users to be able to drive the data mesh, drive it to gain insight in the way that they want. So for us, that car, or certainly for me, we need to have three things, a mesh asset marketplace, that self-service analytics canvas, maybe with natural language one day. And we need to have a very clear product onboarding framework to give us that sort of self-service infrastructure if we want to add more to the mesh. So these are not trivial things. And this is where, as I've been saying to you, that it feels like data mesh is a very sort of idealistic view when it comes to achieving some of these things. It's a very high bar to entry, certainly for some of my enterprise customers. You know, it's very challenging, but at least we have a set of ideals that we can go after. I don't think it's bad to have that. And certainly I agree with a lot of the concepts and things that we're trying to achieve here, but it's still hard. And I still think there's a lot that we have to figure out together for this to happen. So with that and considering timings, I think I was gonna go for about an hour. Let's just sort of wrap up with some conclusions and next steps here. I've certainly raised more questions than I've answered. I appreciate but we've talked about enough technology to see where we could implement some of it. So we had those four principles of the data mesh, and we've kind of gone after a lot of them with, with what we could do to try and front load some of that technical thinking. There is, of course, still all of these unanswered questions around the side. Yeah, you know, what are those technical answers going to be for some of that as well? But then we say, okay, well, what next then? What next and where do we go from here? Especially if we bring back that triangle of people, process, technology. 
Well, this is kind of where I spend most of my days now thinking about what a starting point could look like. What does an organization have? Where do they want to get to, you know, and, and where do we go? So I've blogged and put together this as a, a starting point roadmap. If somebody is going after a data mesh architecture with swim lanes for the business, the people, you know, the process, the, the technology. So you can go and grab this from my blog, certainly. And the sort of the outcome here on the bottom right is building that first data product, but building it with enough of the front loaded thinking to address a lot of those other aspects of that data mesh. So this is kind of one lens to it as for what next, not a technical one, but you know, what could happen. Now, another way to try and consider it is with a logical architecture always a, a good fun thing to try and do for an organization and we say yeah okay let's start with a data domain could be you know hr or sales or whatever go after a data domain to begin with figure out what our data product is going to be now those are kind of the two levels that we talk about in the theory but obviously i want to kind of extend that i want to say within that data product we're going to have to consider operational data, analytics, and maybe predictive data as well. Maybe we want data science going into that data product as well. It might make sense to do so. So I'm going to extend that data product with more things that we might want to add in there. And once we've kind of delivered that sort of isolated data mesh data product on its own, we can then sort of extend that. We can go after other data domains. Now, what I find in large organizations that that's not enough. We need to extend the, the hierarchy here. So I'm going to introduce what I'm going to call a division. I think we have to wrap these data domains and their data products into a wider container, if you like, because for enterprises, they need that. Those guardrails that mean, you know, these data domains belong to this division. And sure, there might be some outliers along the way, you know, some data products that don't quite fit. They can still, of course, become part of the mesh, but you know, who is the owner there is kind of a tricky one. And you'll see deliberately I've overlapped some of these data domains as well, particularly where we combine data sets. Those data sets could be combined and could be surfaced as a new data product. You know, we have to be pragmatic. Now, once we kind of do this, the next thing I like to try and define in my logical data mesh architecture is what that core platform is going to contain. That question I raised earlier about what should be centralized and what should be decentralized. So in this core platform, I've got, of course, our identity stuff, you know, Azure Active Directory in our case. I've got that asset marketplace that I talked about from that SaaS plane, you know, that virtualization layer. It feels like some of these things, they should be centralized and they should be part of that core platform to facilitate what's going to go into this highly scalable mesh. Reference data hub, I think, is a key one. So we need to start building out some of this stuff as well, maybe in parallel to what's happening there on the left, possibly. But, you know, once we have some of that, we can sort of start accelerating. We can start onboarding more divisions and domains and, and more products, which means, you know, we then sort of take advantage of all of this. Now, this is still hard. This is still a challenge. And we can wrap all of that up and say, you know, fine, we've got this decentralized or scalable set of things within our data mesh. But have we really added any business value from that? It's a tough one. We could have, you know, a, a delivery teams of sort of 50 engineers here creating that core platform and onboarding these things. And we've not actually achieved anything new when it comes to that insight yet. So it is a high bar to entry, not just in terms of what you've got to build, but also I think in terms of justification for doing it. We can see the benefits once we achieve something like my picture on screen. And yeah, we can get those blended data sets and our 
data product onboarding, you know, we can certainly achieve a lot more velocity and rapid delivery and stay ahead of the curve with the competition. Sure. But it's definitely a challenge. So things to think about and say, you know, what next? And this is kind of what I'd encourage is what next? Define that logical architecture. The last kind of perspective on it that I want to offer to you is this one. So we want to facilitate those business users. So what I see is when we are actually building out a data mesh or implementing it, we start with that army of business analysts to go and investigate, to sort of front load a lot of that people and process and understanding that we have within the business. We can then start ramping up the engineering team you know, to build the car, ramp up that engineering team to get that first data product in there to achieve that milestone of that minimum viable mesh. We onboard that core platform. And I think once a lot of that engineering effort has gone into creating the, the car, the engine, we can then sort of scale down the engineering. We can then ramp up again with the business users that are now empowered to gain insight from that mesh because of all of those capabilities that have now been created by our engineers. They can go and drive the car. So just another perspective on it that I think sort of makes sense with all of the things we have in that mesh implementation. Lots of tech, lots of people, lots of process, but let's not lose sight of the goal here as well. We want to empower those business users through those technical things that we've created. And with that, I think one minute to half past, I'll say thank you very much for listening, everybody. And if you'd like to scan this QR code and connect with me on LinkedIn, then please do and, and please reach out to me. Thank you very much. Paul, thank you so much for this presentation. You made a really good job. And I'm sure that uh, your talk was really interesting and useful for our participants. Maybe someone have any questions? Yeah. Fire away. Yeah, I have a couple one. Yeah, th th thanks again. It's really comprehensive and uh, a lot of uh, different interesting topics covered. So um, first question, uh, Microsoft has this uh, architecture uh, called uh, data landing zone concept and yeah. it's also related to some decentralized architecture H how it's your opinion is interconnected to, to 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 what you just presented for me the the landing zone architecture and i, I have implemented it for, for customers before it's about getting that raw data into the cloud as soon as possible you know, we we can have some very disparate systems uh, in some cases all over the all over the world, and I like to have regional landing zones. So this is how I, I like to think about it and how I've implemented it. So regional landing zones that bring that data in and then into a a sort of central platform. Now, how we apply that to a data mesh architecture, uh, I'm trying to avoid saying it depends, but you know. It can be, I think, subjective as well. We might want to have something in our mesh, something centralized, possibly, that handles all data ingestion. Yeah, you know, we, we could do. I'm not saying it's perhaps the, the best way to go about it, but we could. We could say that, you know, we have a centralized landing zone or we have some regional landing zones to get our data in. You know, it might make sense for the infrastructure and the network that the customer has. Or, you know, we say each data product is going to be the, the master of their own data ingestion, in which case, you know, each data product has its own landing zone to get that data in. And we sort of end up in roughly the same place. But, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not giving you a direct answer because I don't think there is one. But this would kind of be my views on that landing zone architecture versus how we implement it in a scalable mesh with you know, some pragmatism thrown in there as well. That, that's that's my view that pragmatism is missing in pure data mesh concepts. Yeah. So if we go about principles, then says that 
all those pipelines should be independent. Only the governance, the interfaces, sharing should be um, centralized. So I'm really struggling to um, take pure principles of data mesh as they are into real life implementations. Yeah, and, and that would be my experience as well. You know, the the um, Jamax book, it's 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 full of ideals uh, and it's full of things that could be very subjective depending on our customer implementation. This is where I think it becomes our job as you know consultants, whatever, data engineers to to address where that pragmatism is required. Because otherwise, if we go after those ideals, yeah, the, the bar to entry just becomes so high that we never end up doing anything. I, I've ended up in conversations for hours on end, just trying to define data domains, allow, you know, align to those sort of pure principles. And, it, you know, it, we, we just go nowhere because nobody in an organization can agree what that data domain is or who owns it even. So ideals have to be met with pragmatism if we're going to achieve this. Another, thank you. And another quick question. So, in your diagrams, I I, I didn't see any uh, man, like mentioning of uh, Senum's dedicated SQL pool. So, uh, did you do that intentionally, or do you think dedicated SQL pool is not like it's hard to isolate for different data domains or something like that? Um, uh, I didn't do it intentionally. Um, if I kind of flip the okay. slides back to this one. I've I've got Synapse in there as kind of a multi-plane component. What compute we choose to use for what we're trying to do, you know, I, I don't mind, I guess, at, at that point. If we All need right. a, a massively parallel data warehouse capability to do our, our data processing and, and get that insight, you know, fine. Um, my, my data products that I've got on the left-hand side there I kind of just threw some icons in that might represent what could be happening for a, a given data product. I think as, as long as we have consistency in terms of the interfaces, the underlying storage and compute doesn't necessarily matter too much, whatever that person wants to implement for their data product, for whatever they're trying to achieve. All right. All right. I agree. But yeah, just talking conceptually, like data warehousing and master data management, it's something which is not really well connected, well, like kind of covered by data mesh. Right. No, because it's it's too hard to think about, right? Um, which is where I said in, in my sort of core logical architecture, um, I, I had this reference data hub as part of that core platform. It feels like there's definitely some master data management elements that need to go into that. We don't have good technical answers to all of these things. I, I'm applying a very sort of Microsoft lens to it on it at the moment as well. I appreciate there's lots of other vendors and products out there, you know, like Calibra and Denodo and things that could offer us some capability that might improve what we already have in the Microsoft landscape. It, it depends again sadly i think it, you know it's a it's a hard one to go after there's lots of ways it could be implemented it's it's very subjective yeah thank you everybody happy absolutely thank you so oh, much this means we're all ecstatic okay folks well if um I say re reach out to me on um, on some sort of social media platform or, or email or, or whatever else you want. And uh, I guess with that, I will I'll drop off and uh, I'll say goodbye for now. Yeah, thank Paul, you thank you so much for this talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now.